All of my lovers need stimulation. Don't you know, gigolos get lonely too. Okay, let's talk about originals. I finally got it. Time to do a, a first impressions review. So, I mean, these are my first impressions. So, the scores and my opinions of this, they may go up or down slightly in the next few weeks. I've only listened to it completely about three times, but I've listened to some tracks several times. But we're going to talk about Prince's Originals. It's the latest release from the estate and the fourth such release from the estate in the space of um, 10 months. If we include um, a piano and microphone 1983, which as you know, I wasn't that impressed with, but then again, never was really anyone else. Um, the three albums that were really released, the beautiful, um, you know, um, Musicology 3121 and Planet Earth, which we were a lot more impressed with, except for maybe the cost. Of course, the rave box in here about this for bed. You know, I haven't even listened to this yet, basically. Maybe I need to get in my energy. And now this. So hopefully, Estate, we've had a lot. So maybe you just might want to ease back with some of the releases now. Of course, I know there is a deluxe edition of this coming out, which would be helpful because, let's face it, I wasn't blown away with this packaging. It's very cheap, nasty cardboard already here. There's already quite a nasty crease coming down through absolutely no fold of my own. Pretty much opened it up and it was like that. But apart from that, I do like this artwork, though, showing all the original singles because... Hopefully a lot of people who aren't massive Prince fans will buy this and wonder where these songs eventually ended up because they know they're not on any Prince album, so you, he must have done them for other people. Now I just want to clear up one little baby baby thing before we go further. Um, some people were saying, oh this cover looks a lot like Prince Michael Jackson's bad cover. And here, I want you to make your own opinion there. Do you really see any similarities between the two? Because I seriously don't. First of all, this was eight years later, six or seven years later. Um, bad is not spray painted on the wall behind, it's just like being aided by some graphic artist. Here, it's clearly spray painted on the wall behind Prince. Prince is wearing his early Dirty Mind era get up of like October, November 1980. This is judging by Jackson's skin colour, this could not be any earlier than the start of 1987. And also, the mullet also bears that out, whereas Prince is, this is just basically after Prince shaved up that Afro perm thing he had in the 70s. And um, so, I think, sorry, Jackson people, and I'm one of them, but you know, Prince got there first. And finally, I just want to show you guys this um, again, this wonderful book. I typed an earlier version of this video, but I scrapped it because I didn't look very well presented and I looked like I was half asleep, so I wanted to perk up a bit, a cup of coffee. Here you are, this is proof. I mean, Alan Bolio took these photos in early 1980. This is a cover photo here, and here's some of the shots that did not quite make the cut. Like I said, if you do not have this book, people, buy it. I mean, I know it's printed by the University of Minnesota, but you can pretty much buy it online. Electric Fetus has some. I think it's worth every cent. I think Alan Bolio did a bang-up job taking these photos. And it's really from a period where you don't see too many colour photographs of prints. Buy it, buy it. it's 1980 to 82 base. Or well, there's one parade era photo in it. It's absolutely great. I reckon and rend it totally. Now, back to what we're doing. Okay. And this is what your disc looks like, basically. So again, you've got that spray-painted title. Um, spray-painting walls behind is nothing new. I mean, Prince did it. I mean, if you watch Madonna's Borderline video, one of my favourites, she does the same thing in the um, Yuppie Artist Studio where she starts spray-painting everything with a can of spray paint. You know, so... We're not dealing with anything new here. Now what I've done, I've only listened to the album a couple of times. Basically 15 songs, they all work for other artists, but as you know, Prince recorded a lot of music for other people. And what he'd do when he gave someone a song, he'd write it, put all the, he'd do all the musical backing. So basically the musical backing on 90% of these songs is the same as you hear on the version by the um, artist it was intended for. Then Prince did a guide vocals over top, and Prince would not just sing the song for the artist, he would sing it in the way how he wanted the artist to do it. Especially if the, there are two types of artists he recorded for. One was his direct protégés like Apollonia 6, The Time, Jill Jones. And then there were external people like Kenny Rogers and Sheila. And Sheila, who actually was an independent satellite. And of course, um, who are, of course, Martika, you know, people who weren't basically Prince protégés, but just said, hey, Prince, can you give me this song? Prince would sing it and he'd nuance it. So like you'd hear the way how Prince was singing that song. That's what he wanted you to recapture when you recorded it, especially if you were one of his protégés where you would have to do it. If you were an independent artist, it was optional, but it would just sound better. And basically, I mean, you could generally tell, like, when you hear Laughing Compares to you, Sinead definitely sounds a lot like St. Paul, where St. Paul was forced to do it that way. And, of course, there's a story going on that Prince had been in the studio for hours and hours and then trying to get these vocals right. Mainly on the screams of passion, though, rather than Nothing Compares to You, which was really just an add-on add track. But Sinead did it in her own way, and, of course, you know, she turned it into instant platinum. So let's review some songs. Okay, the album starts off very strong with one of my favourite songs. I'm not going to go into what the subject in the songs is because that's really for the artist it was intended for. I mean, I know some of you probably can't get past the fact that 
some of these songs were basically aimed at girl groups with girl singers and probably had, you know, themes about, you know, basically she's singing a way to bring in a man, basically, and pleasing a man. So I know Ha Ha Ha, Prince is singing about he needs seven inches or more. If he ever did a version of Nasty Girl, I'd love to hear that. You know, but let's move on and be mature adults here. So, okay, sex shooter. I mean, it's hard to be a mature adult with a song title like that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and, and you just think of that sleazy nightclub called The Taste. It's got, like, that old church black woman, you know, going, getting down with her young granddaughter. Well, you know, they're going, I need you to get off. You're my private bus. But well, Prince singing it too sounds just as slow. He cracks it and goes, I can't do it alone. I'm a sex shooter, shooting love in your direction. Come on, kiss the girl. And even funnier is they've still left in Brenda's backing vocal tracks. You know, Brenda's doing, come on, kiss the girl. Guaranteed good fun. It's just hilarious. But it is a great song. I can't get over that synth line. That synth line's made that. Dun. And of course, straight away, I think of Myra Stagg going, stop, stop, stop. You ladies don't seem to realize how valuable my time is. Now you're going to make my boys look bad. Now what's wrong? Your shoes aren't too tight or something? We'll come up with our own steps. Remember? We tried that. Remember? Now you're in the best possible position you'll be in. So let's have some action. Let's have some asses wiggling. I want some perfection. What? I mean, that's all I think of when I hear that song. And I'm just trying to imagine Morris Day saying that to Prince. I want some perfection. I want some asses wiggling. I want some perfection. It's just hilarious. So for Morris Day is saying you're making his boys looking better, are we talking about Morris's boys or are we talking about Prince? Because really, the only person who's going to look bad if someone stuffs up that song is Prince. Because Prince did the original bitch version of it. Now, Jungle Love. Way too much time on song one, but it's worth it. Nine out of ten song. Jungle Love, eight and a half, I think. Um, great song. I mean, Prince does a good version of it. I think he captures Morris's nuances quite well. Or should we say Morris captures Prince's nuances quite well. Jungle Love is just a great song. It must have been recorded before that famous performance in October 83 where Prince basically recorded Jungle Love and the Bird and that's the versions you hear on basically Ice Cream Castle and the ones they lip sync to in Purple Rain, the movie. Um, but Jungle Love, again, is just a great song. I mean, it's basically about, you know, a white girl, you know, she wants to be loved by a black man. Just broke my first rule about talking about the song content. Um, girl, I'm gonna show you, show you, dun, 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 my Jungle Love. Oh, here we go, here we go. Girl, I'm gonna ride you, ride you. And the good thing about that is if you listen to the time version too, you can actually hear some of Prince's backing vocals. But here, Prince is doing the main vocals and it actually sounds like Morris Day is doing backing vocals, which is really interesting. Um, great song, what more can I say? Manic Monday. Okay, it's another girl song. Okay, people go, oh, it's a Bangles song. So going back on why I said, you know I mean? They can do it any way they want it. Actually, the song was first intended for Apollonia 6, but Prince took it off the album, don't ask me why, and they gave them a fellow, you know, happy birthday, Mr. Christian, in its place. Um, basically, so Prince was expecting, you know, Apollonia to capture all his nuances, and like St. Paul, Apollonia was not the greatest singer, not the most confident one, and Prince wasted quite a lot of tape on her. Um, still a great song, though. Why did I have to choose last night to get down? You know, it's just a great song. I like it too. Seven out of ten, or maybe even eight, you know. Noon Rendezvous, I mean, a song about some, you know, noontime nookie or afternoon delight. I mean, afternoon delight, that's a song I definitely like a lot more. I mean, sticks and stones together, gonna work out right. Looking forward to a little afternoon delight. But basically, um, there's a sort of like a plaintive piano feel to it. Maybe I've got to stop doing this. This flimsy thing is getting even flimsier and dirtier. Um, it's a great song, you know, in the sense of the songwriting, but musical performance it just doesn't come out for me i'm sorry i mean because i respect the song you know it's a very mature deep song i mean i'm not gonna knock five and a half maybe a six out of ten okay um makeup well this is just really a skit i mean if all the vanity six songs prince could have done he could have done something better than this he could have at least done bite the beat or drive me wild and definitely nasty well you mentioned prince singing i can't stand it get it up i need seven inches or more i mean that would just be hilarious but no, he gave us makeup, which is just, like I said in the Vanity Six view, it's just a scat. Okay, better song, yeah. 100 Miles Per Hour, I just love that song. I mean, it's an awesome song. I love the driving, propelling guitar, and sort of, you know, also the synthesizer and drum beat. It's just a full-on powerful rock song. 100 miles an hour, baby, that's what I'm all about. I need a lover that can slow me down, somebody that can make me shout. Basically, I mean, again, I'm talking about the content of the song. Basically, it's about a man he loves too fast. He's too much in a rush. But what he wants is some smooth, calm woman that can just tone him down. I mean, basically, 
It's about someone who's just way too intense, which really sums up Prince better than any of the guys in Maserati. You know, so Terry Christian or Brown Mark or anyone, it's definitely a Prince song that Prince should have kept for Prince because there's also a bootleg version of it which just blows me away. I mean, it's a great song, 9 out of 10. You're My Love, well, no. I never liked Kenny Rogers. I don't think many people who are fans of Prince are really big fans of Kenny Rogers. I mean, and that's rich coming from someone like me who listened to a lot of M.O.R. and Yacht Rock. I mean, I listen to a lot of Paul McCartney and Elio Sayer and um, even Christopher Cross, but, you know, Kenny Rogers, he's just a bridge too far. I mean, this is a slow song. I mean, okay, I admire Prince's versatility for the fact that he could write a slowed down country ballad song. I mean, that's definitely a stretch for someone who's generally considered to be an R&B, funk and rock and roll artist and also a dance pop artist. So kudos for that. But this song doesn't work and I have to be really harsh here. I mean, I really don't think it belongs in this album. I mean, we've had all these really high quality, you know, slowly pop songs and rock and roll genius epics, basically, and some sexified R&B. This doesn't belong. One out of ten. Sorry. I know it's cruel. Moving on to something better, um, not much better though, Holly Rock. Um, I've never really been a big fan of this either. It's a good chant, I mean, it's a good floor filler, you know. But considering where it comes from, the sort of like the late parade era, I mean, I just don't think that, that they could have done better examples. I mean, like Prince doing a version of like Prince, they could have put on like, say, Prince's version of Mutiny or High Fashion from the same time because there's live versions of those songs. I mean, they're awesome songs, but Holly Rock is very average. Okay, there's a good little funk breakdown towards the end, which is really funky, but I know, isn't that just lazy syntax? But it just doesn't work for me. I'm sorry. I mean, I can't give it more than a 4 or 5 out of 10. Okay, from this point onwards, there'll be no more running down. I mean, the last seven songs are all awesome. Okay, Baby, You're a Trip. I mean, this could have been an 11 out of 10 song. I absolutely love Baby, You're a Trip. But again, it's these bootleg versions, especially the ones of perfectly unreleased prints that I like. This one's not quite so good. He's left in Jill's backing track. It's a bit shorter, you know, it misses some of the powerful, intense gravitas of the originals. It's still a good song though, you cannot kill a song this good. And I mean, I, I mean, the scream's still in there, but I feel like the scream's even been shorn of some of its power, you know, but still I'm going to give it 8 out of 10, it's a good song. Okay, even better is the Glamorous Life, I mean, I've always loved Glamorous Life, it's probably the best Sheila E song besides um, probably a Love Bazaar. I mean, a Love Bazaar just has so many twists and turns in it. And, Heck, if he wanted to get rid of You're My Love, I mean, he should have put in his version of A Love Bazaar. That would just be bloody awesome, you know. But anyway, The Glamorous Life is still a good second cross. I mean, I just love the conga beat and the rhythm in them, and I'm sure it's probably Sheila actually playing the musical beat there. I don't think that's Prince. I think it's definitely Sheila on the congos, but here Prince is doing the vocals. Maybe saying, hey, I want you to sing it like this, Sheila. Put some Latin flavour into it. You know, and the, it's just a great song. I mean, he's singing about a girl on the make, you know, but she has to shop at section. Like, he wants to live the glamorous life without love. It ain't much. It ain't much. Please, the glamorous life. Great song. Okay. Jiggalos get lonely too. Again, like Harm the Glamorous Life. This is definitely a nine and a half, ten out of ten song. I mean, Jiggalos get lonely too. It's just a fantastic song. I mean, I know a lot of people aren't really that crazy about the time doing ballads, but I mean, I've already praised the Morris Day version of the song back on my time review. But Prince's version is even better. I mean, he adds even more cream to the vocals. I mean, Morris overall probably does better singing than Prince, which is still good, basically. But I feel the song suits Prince more. I mean, I can believe the song more coming out of Prince's mouth, if you get what I mean. I mean, this is definitely the type of, you know, when Prince is trying to be Mr. Sincere Lover Man, whereas I'm sorry, Morris... I can't see him as being very convincing or sincere. I just see him, I mean, no disrespect, but the character of Morris Day you hear in the time is just basically a sleaze, you know what I mean? He's not wanting to basically, you know, open up his true feelings to some conquest, you know? I think Morris is like, he's just a party man, you know? It's like, baby, you don't, oh, sure, you certainly don't sound like you look. Well, excuse me. That's okay, baby. I'll talk to you later. And you know damn well he ain't going to talk to you later. You know, yeah, so that's, the, that's the Morris Day of me, whereas Prince is like, you know, this is like the type of love song Prince would sing to Susanna or um, Vanity or someone else, really. But still, great version, 9 out of 10. Okay, Love, They Will Be Done, just another beautiful ballad, I mean. There's an ethereal quality to this song, and I think that you need the right singer and the right voice to catch the gravitas and the emotion and the message. And I think in this case, both Martika and Prince nailed it. I mean, Prince is, it's easily one of the best songs he gave to somebody else, and I think... Like you said, I think sometimes Prince could be very selective in who he gave the song to. I'm sure other people said, Prince, I want to record the song. Prince like, no, 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 I need to find the right singer. And I think with Martika, you know, she was Latin American. She had this almost soul type upbringing. In a lot of ways, she was sort of more a more glamorous Ingrid Shabby without the hippie pretense. But 
yeah, I think he just nails them. I mean, I just, I can't even go into parts of the song. Like, just about the whole thing just gives me goosebumps, basically. I mean, it's just a beautiful song. Dear Michelangelo, now, this is going to be a bit of a rant. Okay, first of all, I give, oh, Love was, again, another nine and a half, ten song. Um, Dear Michelangelo's got a good musical backing. Basically, for those of you who don't know, it's an obscure song. It was basically one of the album songs of um, Sheila E's Romance 1600, the same album that gave us a Love Bazaar and, um, you know, Sister Fate, again, another great Probably of all the female protégés, apart from Jill Jones, I mean, Sheila E, some of her stuff is just incredible, you know. One of these days I should just review all the Sheila E albums, because she's amazing, basically. And yet, yet there's so much more to her besides basically what she did with Prince. But anyway, um, Dear Michelangelo, I mean, I like it, but the lyrics are wrong. I mean, it's basically singing about a girl who's having wet dreams to basically pictures of Michelangelo and pictures done by Michelangelo. Because as you know, Michelangelo did some very, how shall we say, precise anatomical art, especially of um, males. And male members and everything else. I mean, I've actually been to see the Sistine Chapel in the flesh, and I just have to say it's be humbling actually seeing it in front of you. It's incredible, because on the roof you've got like the earlier part, which was painted around 1499 to 1510, when Michelangelo was not just a young man, but then the piece de la resistance is looking at the wall, the Last Judgment, which was painted much later in 1536, which is when Michelangelo was a lot older and a lot more bitter, and at the end you can see a very angry looking face in the corner, and that's Michelangelo parodying himself. I mean, the man was nice, but what I take exception at is the fact that Michelangelo was probably one of the gayest human beings ever to walk the face of the earth. He had absolutely no interest in women. I've watched programs, read books about how if you look at all the female figures of Michelangelo's art, they all look rather buxom and masculine. He does not really paint absolutely gorgeous women with beautiful, voluptuous breasts or long, flowing tresses. They look more like house frows, basically, or, you know, like Mrs. Corleone type woman, you know, or Mama, Mama Leone types, you know, rather than beautiful woman. But his men are all absolutely exquisite. They've got muscle chests. They all look powerful and masculine. I mean, you've got to realize that David was done by a Michelangelo. I mean, that's got to be the most homoerotic thing ever, you know, because in those days, having a big, you know what, was considered vulgar rather than nice. But still, so it's a wet bit misplaced, and I feel like, you know, Prince is trying to apply these um, heteronormative specials onto um. Michelangelo, and being a darling of the Catholic Church, of course his true sexual proclivities will never come out. I mean, they found love letters from Michelangelo to men. I mean, another famous story goes that Leonardo da Vinci hit on Michelangelo, and Michelangelo rebuffed him as a boy, and that's why they hated each other's guts, because da Vinci was also very, very gay. So was Raphael, and of course um, the other one that comes to mind, although I'm probably, I'm not 100% sure here, but I heard a rumour that possibly also um, Galileo was gay. So, I mean, of course, I mean, Freddie Mercury keeps singing his name several times in his greatest song. How many more damn Galileos do we have to do? Galileo, Galileo, Galileo. But anyway, um, so there you are. There's my little epistle. Wouldn't you love to love me? This is another song that's been done to death. And, of course, the story is that Prince was going to give it to Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson turned it down. As you know, um, Sue Ann Carwell did a version. Then much later, Taja Savelle did. And Prince actually, this is actually an earlier version than the one that he gave to Taja Savelle, because I've actually heard the bootleg version of Prince's proto version for Taj Savelle, which has a sort of more late 80s sort of dance feel to it. And Prince's voice has gone for a vocoder. Here Prince is singing a sort of raw sort of falsetto with a bit of growl. I mean, it's definitely controversy era. It's not bad. I mean, it's actually one of the earlier uses of the Lynn organ. It would date from the same time as Private Joy and Jack Kowalf. It's a pretty good song, and I'm going to give it an 8. Finally, we've got Nothing Compares to You. It's exactly the same version as you hear on this beautiful single that came out last year. I mean... One word to describe this song, goosebumps. You listen to it, you get goosebumps. Not only is it a perfectly written song, great topic, Prince is just, his voice is just totally on point. You just feel the emotion in every part of his voice. I mean, he's got that soulful growl, he's got the sort of, you know, normal pleading falsetto, he's got the sort of, you know, nice baritone running right through it. I mean, it's just a masterpiece. I mean, you just wonder what was going on through Prince's head when he was just recording songs like this. I mean, they're just absolutely amazing. And what's even harder to believe about, this was recorded at the same time as the dance electric. So I think that shows you the versatility of Prince because the dance electric is like a real upbeat party song. And again, you hear it on Purple Rain Deluxe. It's one of his very finest. Nothing compares to you as a 10 out of 10 song. Perry, there are some downsides to tell me. I think the free tracks, Make Up, You're My Love and Holly Rock Need to Go, they don't belong there. They're just filler. Um, the packaging, I already said, ugh, really? Cheap and nasty. You know, um... The sequencing isn't that great ever. I think you could like put all the girl songs in one part, all the upbeat funk numbers in the bell part, and then the ballads like, you know, um, Nothing Compares to You and um, 
you know, gigolos get lonely too in another spot. Um, also too, what I don't like about this album is the fact that Tidal got first dibs on it, you know, why do they always get advantages over us with old fashioned people who like cities, especially as a lot of us now are a lot older, I mean we're all in our 40s now and I've got grey hair, I had to go outside and shave because I look like I just walked in off the street in the first take of this video, you know, so. It's a good it's a good album. I mean realistically, I mean if you're a big fan of Prince I'd buy it. If you're a new beginner fan of Prince, I'd buy it too, because this way you're exposed to his raw versatility in music. I mean, generally I know I'm one of the last people to review this, but generally the, the fan community's been fairly positive about it. I mean, there's a lot to like, and I mean, to be even to be honest with you, when I first heard it I wasn't that shit hot on it, but already I'm getting better at liking it. Um If there was a second set of originals, I mean I really do think a state, this is a winner, you've done well here, give yourselves a clap. But if you find any more Prince Originals, I would definitely get them out there. And especially, all I want you to do is just go out and find a Prince mix of Nasty Girl. I don't know why, I just have this desire to hear Prince sing Nasty Girl, basically. Or even Prince to sing, let me guess, Prince to sing some of the more colourful time songs like Get It Up, Cool, Wild and Loose, and Prince singing 77793.11. That would just be awesome, basically. We could just call it... Prince Originals does the time in Vanity 6, basically. Yeah, but there you go. There's the Originals. If you don't have it, buy it. It's cheap, so I mean, it's out there for the people. I mean, unlike most recent releases, I didn't have to wait like three weeks for it to come through like I did with Piano and Microphone. Pretty much June 22nd, I got up, it was there. And I could just buy it. There were copies of it everywhere. They were promoting it in the recommended records of the week. Even one of the guys in the shop said, you know, you know, you should get into Prince by listening to this. So there you go. Have a purple time, and um, I guarantee you no more goofing around. The next video will be Purple Rain related.